Uh, welcome everyone um, for this um, um, event on the Wednesday webinar. Uh, we usually have our webinars on the second Wednesdays of every month, but we had to postpone it um, to the third Wednesday this time because of the hurricane. So um, thank you everybody, uh, Dr. Ekmark for adjusting to the new schedule and all of you participants from also adjusting and um, coming back um, for this event, uh, which is a week delayed. Um, as usual, I'll start by a, a short introduction of Dr. Ekmark, and I'll let her um, introduce and tell her about her wonderful accomplishments. So, um, Dr. Ekmark leads the Environment, Social, ESG, uh, and Governance (ESG) uh, initiatives for several American fashion brands, and she plays a key role in promoting sustainable decision making uh, across both facilities and uh, supply chains. Uh, she recently acquired uh, um, uh, IFRS certification, um, which is Sustainable Accounting, from the IRFS, IFRS Foundation. Um, and her academic background is also very impressive. Uh, she earned her PhD from the Central Michigan University, and she has de degrees in textile science and statistics uh, from North Carolina State University. Um, and she's also degrees in apparel production from Bowling Green State University. Um, an interesting fact, um, besides her, her academic and um, uh, corporate qualifications, is uh, Dr. Ekmark is thoroughly devoted to this idea of sustainability and um, conservation. So in her spare time, um, I don't know where she finds that with all she does, <laughs> but um, in her spare time, she she... Uh, is associated with the Python conservation program at the Everglades um, and supporting uh, sustainability initiatives in the state of Florida uh, and Everglades. So I'm, I'm, I don't think, I don't know if um, she was planning to talk about that, but even th that's <laughs> super interesting. And, and so along with the circularity, it'll be nice to hear about that effort also. Of right, course. I will hand it over to Dr. Ekmark. Um, take us through for the next 30 minutes. Well, thank you for that introduction, Dr. Shah. I appreciate that. Um, as he said, I'm Ashley Eckmark. I uh, work with uh, fashion brands, a lot, pretty varied, colorful background academically. Um, and in my free time, I go and hunt pythons in the Everglades. Uh, they are kind of overrunning the Everglades, eating a lot of the native wildlife. So it supports uh, our natural ecosystems down here in Florida. familiar with circularity? Did I go out for a minute? Yes, you did. Am I back? Okay, perfect. Yes. I'll start over. Some of you might be familiar with circularity and some of you might not. So I'm going to do a quick overview of what circularity is, but more importantly, we're going to be focusing on what circularity actually means in practice and how we get from where we are to a more sustainable supply chain system. So we are all familiar with supply chain in one way or another, and I'm sure we've all seen a diagram similar to this before. So uh, two stages I really wanna talk about though that are not always included in our supply chain diagrams are this first one, the product design stage. So there's not a lot of physical movement happening here. This is the step often left out, um, but this is the stage that determines everything that happens afterward. Uh, what raw materials you're choosing, how the product is manufactured, and where it ends up being disposed is all kind of dictated in that product design stage. Speaking of the product disposal stage, that is our second one that is often forgotten. Uh, especially in the U.S., our waste systems are very well hidden, so much so that they are often forgotten completely. But this product disposal is the last step in the life cycle of our products. This is becoming more important and more visible as different states make laws uh, regarding recycling and producer responsibility for things like packaging or the products themselves. Um, businesses are becoming much more aware of how their products are disposed and thinking more about that end of life stage. So when we look at this linear supply chain and we think about how do we make it better, how do we make it more sustainable? We often look at things like transportation and thinking about, oh, how do I make uh, fuel, fuel efficiency a priority in, in my trucks or in my planes? 
or how do we look at these manufacturing processes and make it so that they use less water or use less energy? And these are all good steps that will drive some improvements, but they will only take you so far. Let's talk about some other more creative options. So reduces our initial instinct, and that's uh, kind of what we just talked about. This can be done in the existing system. But if we kind of change the lens that we're looking at our supply chain with, looking more at the products themselves, let's talk a little bit more about <clears throat> how these definitions change. So when you're thinking about products and reducing, it can mean optimizing your inventory, or it can mean reducing the overall environmental and social impact of the products as a whole. Uh, we can also think about repairing, reusing, and reselling products. Thinking about keeping those raw materials in use longer and giving the products that we already have a second life. We can also upcycle and remake goods, transforming them into products that are of higher value. Um, this often works best with durable goods. Clearly, it's, it's not for everything, um, but it should be taken advantage of when, when it can be. Kind of our last resort for, for products is the recycle and downcycle. Uh, we've all used the recycled, made with recycled materials, foodware and straws that kind of fall apart as we, as we drink through them. Uh, this is not the ideal stage, but is definitely better than throwing in a landfill or incinerating. So looking at our linear supply chain and then thinking about these options, there isn't any space for them. For these to be viable, we're going to need to reimagine what our supply chain looks like. So unsurprisingly, the circular supply chain is a circle. Please hold your applause till the end. Uh, instead of extracting fresh resources for every product, the materials that we extract are kept in circulation through repairing, remaking, and recycling. And uh, the circular interventions that we're looking at for products should be fit for context. They should create more value in the long term, and they should be made for an evolving and dynamic system. So you can't expect the supply chain to always be static. It's always going to be moving and evolving, as should your products. The key to this circular supply chain transition lies in two different places. It lies in the uh, designing products for reuse and for remaking, and then building our reverse logistics capabilities to be able to support the new end stages and sustainable solutions that we just talked about. So I do want to make a quick point here, just to make a quick note, talking about reducing things in the circular supply chain. So a common criticism is that companies won't want to be more sustainable because it would mean that they need to make and sell less products. That is an option. You can make and sell less products, but it also means that you can make better products. Mm. What do I mean by that? Let's, let's think about a tree. Trees make a lot of leaves. They use those leaves to convert sunlight to energy. And then when they're, they're done with those leaves, the leaves drop and fall to the ground. This is technically waste, these leaves falling. Um, but when they're on the ground, they break down and provide nutrients for the soil and they help nearby trees and plants to continue to grow. So they aren't truly wasted. Is there a way looking at the products that we make that we can change our systems and our products to be additive? to the world around us instead of taking away from it. Just food for thought as we continue. So we're not just talking about product design when we talk about designing products for, for circularity. We are also talking about system design. So we can't talk about circularity without talking about the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. The Ellen MacArthur Foundation pioneered this idea of designing for circularity where starting with product design, they take into account what will happen at the end of the product's life. Where is it going to go? How is it going to be reused or remade? Or how can it be reused and remade? And they came up with six design leverage points that create an environment for a circular transition. These points kind of answer the question of, well, where am I supposed to start? You know, what do I do first? Well, the first thing you're going to want to do is observe and interpret the system. 
The system that you're working in is going to be unique to an individual company. You can't design a new strategy and a new system until you understand the complexity of the one that you're currently in. <clears throat> Once you understand what you're working with, you can envision a circular future. You can ask yourself, what does a truly circular system look like in the industry or for my specific product? You can start to set really good end goals of where you want to end up. Then you're going to want to create conditions for collaboration. Oftentimes, the end goals we're looking for are too big to achieve all on our own, and we need partnership from others in the industry or worldwide, or even maybe partnerships within our supply chains. So many hands make light work, and collaborating allows us to quickly achieve meaningful uh, results and, and scale our impact. <clears throat> to build circular design capabilities, uh, it's not a new job description so much as it's a new way of thinking. So you're going to want to bring employees and other stakeholders along on that journey with you so they understand the end goals and how they can get there and what their part is in that journey. Once everyone has an understanding, you'll be able to rewrite the rules. We put rules in place to achieve specific outcomes. What rules in your system are preventing you from making these positive changes? And you'll want to examine where new rules can be put in place uh, or existing ones might need to be changed to make this transition possible. The last thing you'll need is to develop tools to design and evaluate your system. So these can help embed policies, principles, and guidelines into all of your processes, um, but they'll definitely be specific to the change that you want to create. So all these steps are kind of dependent on one another. If you're curious about how you can influence this kind of circular change and go through these steps, I would encourage you to look into the adaptive strategy for circular design from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation. It's a really great jumping off point for uh, further reading if, if you want to take this another step after this talk. So let's look at an example of what we're talking about here. Abstract is great, but application is better. So we all know Coca-Cola. They're one of the biggest producers of plastic bottles in the entire world. Uh, these plastic bottles are the same ones that often end up in our landfills and in our waterways. Coke is keenly aware of this, and they have been experimenting with circular solutions. In their Central and South American operations, Coke designed a bottle specifically to be refilled and reused, and they called it the universal bottle. So they deliver these full bottles to retail stores and restaurants and then collect the empty bottles at the same locations. The Coke installed equipment at their distribution centers to wash, delabel, and refill these universal bottles with any of Coke's sodas, hence the name universal, allowing them to quickly respond uh, to local demand. So they can collect empty bottles that contain Coke and refill them with Sprite or I can't think of any other Coke products for some reason. <laughs> you know what I mean, though. Yeah. Um, starting in 2018 with this project, uh, they found that their bottles have been reused an average of 25 times, and they estimate that they produced 1.8 fewer 1.8 billion fewer plastic bottles just in Brazil just in 2019. So it's been uh, pretty successful so far, and they're looking at expanding it to, I believe, South Africa next. Very exciting project. And it's a great example of how rethinking product design can support a circular system. So our second uh, key to the circular transition that I mentioned earlier is reverse logistics or the process of collecting used goods and returning them to the supply chain. There's not one specific blueprint of what reverse logistics looks like. Uh, Often it goes hand in hand with circular design, as we saw in our Coca-Cola example. So in that example, they didn't need an entirely new logistics system. They just added new equipment to existing facilities and utilized their existing delivery routes, um, just bringing things back in addition to delivering product out. Um, reverse logistics, unfortunately, is not always that straightforward. Sometimes new systems are needed. So let's look at some examples of New systems, reverse logistics in action. All right, so this one is near and dear to my heart in the fashion industry, uh, a company called ThreadUp. They were founded in 2009, specifically are in the business of clothing resale. They're known for their massive e-commerce platform 
where they will sell secondhand clothes, but they're also responsible for an end-to-end -end reverse logistics system for clothing. So they distribute closet cleanout kits, they call them, to uh, consumers. And then when consumers return that closet cleanout kit, they process and catalog all of those items that they collected. And then they warehouse all of those items uh, the, until those items sell on the, the thread up site. So every item may have an individual SKU, which is no small undertaking um, to have an inventory that large. So as an idea of scale of how big that is or how big they are, ThreadUp processed over 125 million pieces of clothing in 12 years, reducing the amount of textile waste ending up in landfills or shipping to overseas markets in that time. And they are continuing to grow. If you haven't heard of ThreadUp, you probably will. So ThreadUp was innovative for their logistics and distribution, and Coke was innovative in their product design. So this last example is Ostara, and they developed a technological innovation to support circularity in agriculture. So in the process of farming, am I back now? Yes, you are. Perfect, okay. So uh, Ostera is a company, am I frozen again? No, okay. No, you're here. Yeah, I saw you move. Um, Ostera is a company that uh, has technological, technological innovations for agriculture. Um, they, their two-step bacterial treatment system is integrated into wastewater facilities and it recaptures nutrients from wastewater runoff and it can process them into an effective and natural fertilizer that can be resold to farmers. So in addition to the revenue from selling fertilizer, the treatment system saves wastewater plants money by reducing the amount of nutrient buildup on the wastewater machinery. It also reuses those nutrients that originally came from the soil, reducing the need for new synthetic fertilizers and the chemical processes that make them. So uh, the lesson to be learned here is sometimes we'll run into roadblocks that we can't overcome with the tools we currently have, and we need new technological innovation to change the rules of the game. Always be watching out for disruptors like Ostara coming in uh, to change the rules of the game in your industry. <laughs> All right. We've discussed a couple strategies to adapt circular models and methods for integrating reverse logistics. We also examined some of the pain points in our current model and explored how circular leaders are innovating the way forward. What I want you to take away from this is looking at this model, think about where you can partner, innovate, or redesign to support a more sustainable supply chain. The waste that we create does not exist by accident. It's the result of our design decisions. By embedding circularity into our products and our processes, we can make a cleaner economy that works for people, businesses, and for our environment. I know that was a lot of information to throw at you guys, but I am hoping that we have some good questions and keep the conversation going. Uh, Pete had a, a big introduction there, so I'm hoping he's got some good stuff for us. <laughs> Well, first off, um, Dr. Eckhart, that was a great presentation. Uh, I love the marriage of the, of the, you know, if you will, the academic with the practical, with the examples. Um, one of the things, and this is a topic near and dear uh, to my heart, sustainability in my um, supply chain course. We have a capstone sustainability project that the students work on. Um, and one of the things I wanted to pose the question to ask about was to promote better in class practice. You know, one, one of the things I think this space could do more with is recognition of great companies and recognition through industry awards. Now, I know sometimes that can be, I don't know, a bit trite, but I, but I think it's important. And I was curious from your chair, as this space continues to proliferate, evolve, you know, what are some industry recognition awards that you're familiar with? Um, new, old, what are some distinguished awards? I just was curious from your perspective. Well, I know uh, the Ellen MacArthur Foundation does have some awards that they give out every year. Um, and there's a couple other groups that do as well. So, but they're mostly um, like trade publications, if you will. Okay. Like uh, okay. Sourcing Journal has some sustainability awards. Um, 
And I think it kind of depends on what area of sustainability you're focused on, right? So circularity is a bit of a, a weird hybrid. It's both an overarching concept and a specific idea. So there aren't a lot of, of circular awards per se. Okay. I think that's, right. that's a good opportunity going forward. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be looking out because I mean, I think that's just one great way to recognize and promote what success looks like and, mm -hmm. and why. Yeah. You know? So, but the case studies you highlighted were also great. So thank you. Wonderful. I'm glad you liked them. <laughs> I have a I question, have a... Doctor. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, it's okay, Piyush. I was going to ask, uh, Doctor Eckert. The, I have a question here about the uh, thread up. Yes. You know, the do they um, do any any remanufacturing, quote unquote, uh, upgrade, or they just resell us? They, they, they just receive. resell. They do not do any kind of remanufacturing or repairing. Um, mm. So they they get the products in and then uh, kind of sort them out. They have a, a recycling partner. If the garments that come in, you know, are not usable quality, are not resellable quality, they will send them to a recycler. Um, but they don't do any kind of repairing or, or remanufacturing yet. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I imagine they, uh, they sell a lot overseas instead of domestic market. Do you know anything about it? I believe ThreadUp's just a domestic market. Mm -hmm. um, or if it is a, an international one, I, I don't think they have a like a physical presence internationally. So it mm -hmm. might be an e-commerce situation where someone in Canada or Mexico can buy online. Um, but I don't believe that they have distribution centers internationally. Yeah, I think we're going to see more of these models. Uh, major brands are, you know, you know, Patagonia, for example, or LL Beans or REIs. They are really jumping on that circular economy. Absolutely, and the higher value items, uh, like uh, really, really expensive high tech jackets from places like Patagonia, uh, there's a huge opportunity to repair those. And resell them, you know, at us. Sometimes even the ones that are not repaired is worth more money. <laughs> yeah. My internet today. Ever since the hurricane, it's been really in and out. <laughs> mm. Thank you. Thank you Thank for the great presentation. I learned something today. Oh, good. I'm glad. Okay. So I, I had a question. Um, you know, when 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 I look at let's let's suppose I look at my role as a buyer. I'm already okay. under pressure to reduce cost. Um, I am under pressure with COVID to ensure reliability. And then I have some person who is sits is the ESG director pressurizing me for this new thing called sustainability. Um, so the question here is, do you, do you see such pressure where the buyers uh, resist um, sustainability and related initiatives? And two, if yes, how do you work to help overcome such resistance among buyers um, for such initiatives? So there's absolutely resistance, um, but the resistance comes more when you say, this has to be your top priority, mm. right? As opposed to, you know, this has to be somewhere in your list of priorities. So I don't think many businesses are in a place to make this top priority right now. Um, like you said, there's a lot of really disruptive things happening in marketplaces that are going to take first priority. But as long as you are looking at, you know, bringing this across the ocean on a boat, um, do you have the ability to select a boat that has lower emissions? You know, um, kind of putting that on the priority list somewhere, maybe not specifically at the top, but somewhere. Hey, hey can you hear me? Hey, Pete, how you doing? I can. Oh, uh, this is John Fitzgerald. So yeah, we we provide CO2 emissions data to uh, clients all over the world. And uh, 
Uh, I agree with you. Uh, unless there's a ROI, they're not going to do anything. It's uh, it's greenwashing. Uh, but there are customers using that data to do it exactly what you said, use carriers that have better fuel efficient ships, maybe LNG ships, move air. We're working with Apple to convert a lot of air freight to ocean, other clients to move it off a truck onto rail. So with better data, you can make better better decisions. And certainly the uh, circularity, the reverse logistics is an area that hasn't been hasn't been looked at in much detail. So it's like the next horizon, I'd say. I would absolutely agree with that. And thank you for that additional context. Yeah. I think that's very helpful. Um, there, there is a, some question in the chat. Um, so um, Julie, Dr. Julia, she, she has this question that, do you know why this initiative is Coca-Cola is only South America or Africa and it's not expanded uh, globally? You know, I'm not sure. What it sounded like uh, in the case study I was reading they started there, right? Okay. And they're moving it uh, or expanding it as time goes on. So it's possible that it gets to the United States. I'm hoping okay. so. Yeah, usually, usually Coca-Cola does regional uh, proof of concept and then moves globally. So they probably start it with Latin America and then move it from there. We do business with them in Europe. Um, so I mean, a huge company, obviously, right? So they, they usually yeah. test things on a regional basis before they go global. Okay, thank you. There's one more question in the chat. Um, um, Venkatesh, he's in France and listening to us. Um, um, wow. So yeah, you have a global well audience for this. <laughs> and he, his question is that as a practitioner, how are you seeing the circular designs concepts to be integrated with suppliers? What are the risk for brands um, when they rely on suppliers? Um, are they going to be incentivized as brands to try and cut down their cost? Um, just want to hear your thoughts. Oof. Well, those are some uh, very complex questions. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, I think is, this doesn't uh, rebalance the supplier buyer relationship. If that's if that gets kind of what you're getting at with those, um, it stays similar to how it's always been. Where uh, again, we're we're reprioritizing a little bit, and we're saying, hey making things in a more sustainable way is a priority. Um, it might be that there is more demand for more sustainable manufacturing processes that use less raw materials, um, or that some manufacturers switch to kind of a remanufacturing model as opposed mm -hmm. to um, manufacturing with virgin materials. Uh, it becomes more of a processing existing ones, kind of like how, how Coke did in their distribution centers where they added areas to clean bottles and relabel bottles, as opposed to just bringing it in, warehousing it and sending it out. I would say the customers are looking at strategic sourcing and who are the right suppliers that can bring this kind of innovation to them and spending time with them uh, together uh, in a win-win situation. If you help me improve the sustainability and reduce costs, you're going to get more market share. That's an excellent point too. That is, it's happening uh, a lot more than I've ever seen it. Not that I have, you know, the longest tenure in the world, but I've been in the industry for at least a decade now. So yeah, over awesome. that time, in, yeah, in I, just that time, the conversations change. Yeah, absolutely. Hmm. And uh, what, I don't think James Casconi's on from Deloitte, but they have a whole practice in circularity. So it's, you know, it's obviously uh, top of mind. So, and it's, it's really growing when you have somebody like Deloitte bring that out and they announced it, uh, to NRF National Retail Federation back in January. So, yep. Hmm. Oh, yeah. There's one more question uh, from Ethan. Ethan is um, a student at FGCU, and in fact, he's the president of Supply Chain Club. So, um, um, he asked that uh, in aiming for a more supply sustainable supply chain, what strategies can companies adopt to reduce? various forms of waste, including packaging material like boxes and shrink wrap and excess inventory. How can we minimize these wastes while maintaining efficiency? So this is actually such a hot topic that uh, they have a name for it now. They call it eco-modulation. Eco-modulation. So, eco-modulation. So what we're kind of doing with that is um, the industry as a whole, and when I say that, I mean like systems, uh, recycling systems, are, are trying to incentivize retailers and producers of products 
to use better materials in packaging and use less packaging generally. So they're attacking that through extended producer responsibility rules that I mentioned at the top of the presentation. Um, these rules are charging fees for the amount of packaging that any retailer is sending into a specific state or area and um, charging more money for things that are single use, things that are plastic, things that are not recyclable and charging lower fees for things that are recyclable, things that are um, made of recycled materials. Mm -hmm. So it's it's kind of a slow process, but it's uh, really gotten kickstarted with these rules coming out and, and making a financial incentive to make that change. Yeah, mm -hmm. there, there's a company called Pack Size. I have nothing to do with them, but that's what they do is right sizing packaging. And I know Staples, <laughs> just, Staples just did a big project with them. They saved, uh, they reduced packaging waste by 10% in corrugated, cut void fill by 50%, and decrease plastic usage by 71 percent so uh, i think th those are examples of in the packaging side did you um, pull those statistics just for this meeting or do you do you keep them around no, it's, i just got this email i just happen to be looking at it and when you brought it up, <laughs> so, so john, john just to add one other piece to that look the packaging reduction uh, waste reduction uh, initiatives i've seen also have a, a a transportation cost reduction benefit too so oh, yeah, i mean sure. look, there's lots of good reasons to do this but obviously we touched on it earlier when the roi becomes more attractive then there's going to be more investment and 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 more passion for those projects so yeah. um, those stats you rattled off john i'm sure we're on point but you know uh, accompanying that somewhere has got to be the the, the transportation cost sure, reduction less, one, less one would think less transportation costs as well i, I just happen to see the, the highlights of that there's a lot more behind it but sure good case study thanks for yeah. sharing yeah. absolutely all right so really angel... back to greenhouse gas right. emissions as well you know the lighter your product is uh the lower your ton mileage is when you're shipping mm -hmm. that and the lower yeah. your greenhouse gas emissions are from transportation okay. everybody uh, wins Yes. Okay. So just a note here, you don't have to put your question in the chat. You can just uh, wait for it to end and, and say your question yourself. But since I have a few here, the next question is from Angel, uh, Angel Segura. And he says, I'm a supporter of conservation and sustainability. That said, you said companies can build better products, uh, but we can't help but think that better products can lead to less sales. Sears brands were always known for high quality, craftsmen, etc. I have a Sears freezer that I've had for 21 years and still running, no replacement purchase. <laughs> My craftsman lawnmower died after 15 years. I couldn't replace the lawnmower because Sears was out of business. So while I agreed, well, that manufactured high quality products, just a second. Uh, agreed, well, manufactured high quality products, does that mean that impact future sales and profitability? So let me, that's a very good question. Um, let me clarify what I mean by better products. So in that example, um, the, the leaves of the tree fall and they, uh, as they break down, provide nutrients for the soil. They are adding to that ecosystem, that cycle. Um, what I say when I mean better products is products that are additive to our systems. So it's not something like that plastic bottle that's going to sit in our ocean and create, mm. you know, draw more heat down and, and pollute our waterways and not generally not be great. Um, these products are things that work with the environment. They work. Mm -hmm. I was on a roll there that time when I froze. It's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Did you get enough of my sentence to understand? We lost the last sentence. Ah, that's too bad. Okay. Well, the idea is the products contribute to the environment as opposed to pulling out the resources, making them into something that will never break down and um, can't be reused and then, you know, is truly thrown away yeah. after 15 years of lawnmower use. <laughs> So a few more questions here. Edward, who's also a student at FGC, says that, so besides better planning from the start, how can companies implement better sustainability without affecting their traditional operations? 
Is there a cut and dry answer of how to make it easier? You know, I wish that there was, but none of the really good things in life are easy. So <laughs> I think that anyone who believes their business model is set in stone and will never change is kind of doomed <laughs> to fall behind. We're always changing. We're always innovating. We're always finding the next big thing. Hmm. I am of the opinion that the next big thing maybe not features sustainability, <laughs> but uses it as a tool to to get to the next level. Um, so I think that it probably won't be an easy change to make things more circular, to understand, you know, to integrate sustainable circular practices. Um, but I do think it will be beneficial and mm -hmm. customers, stakeholders, associates will all yeah see the benefit pretty quickly. I don't know okay. if anybody from Gartner's on the line, but they usually say that you focus on two modes. One is uh, operational excellence of what we're doing today, and the other is working on the 2B state and the innovations that have to be brought to the business. Exactly. I hadn't heard that before. Hadn't read that specific <laughs> paper, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, interesting. Frank has a question. Do you think this concept addresses issues more so with sustainability in modern day supply chains than modern waste companies use reverse logistics? I'm not sure I understand that question. Not sure I do either. Uh, let me let me read it again. And, and okay, yes, try or, one more time. <laughs> or, or, or maybe um, Frank, you can you can help us a little bit by rephrasing or giving us something I more. Can, oh, yeah, go ahead. I can. Yeah, I had this question in my mind. I just didn't know how to either one, one say it or just tell me how it would make it better, but it just didn't. I think my question really stems from the person who, or people who made this, came up with this model. Were they, did they come up with this model because they had problems with sustainability within their company or they wanted to in, improve the way they do reverse logistics or both? I just don't know where like where the problem was like this model what is, is circularity is, solving for is that yes. kind of what yeah, you're asking like, okay yeah well yeah, what's the problem that like okay this is the answer you know what i mean so the problem that they're solving for is definitely waste um, they're looking around and they're seeing wow we throw away you know 17 million tons of textiles every year that's that's too many it's just in the u.s so they're saying, wow, how did all this waste get here? And they're saying, what do we do about it? So the circularity is the concept they came up with that, that kind of demonstrates that. So their point and my point kind of at the end is that our current system is designed to create waste. It has one directional flow. It goes from raw material to final product being disposed. If we can change that and purposefully design it into a circle, we can keep those materials in use and stop being so extractive, stop using so much more than we need and putting it all uh, in waste so quickly. Thank you so much, thank you. Yeah, th there was some statistic, again, I, I don't remember the exact, uh, one cotton t-shirt needs 700 liters of water or something like that. There's a lot of those floating around. There's a yeah, lot of those I, statistics. I've seen them in uh, like, legislation as well like starting at the beginning of a, a bill the climate uh, climate bills in california have a few about jeans mm -hmm. i think it's like three thousand gallons of water or something to make a pair yes. of jeans it's nuts yeah yes yes okay so there's a very two very interesting questions um one from katrina she says is there such a thing as circularity in services we provide such as insurance or education rather than physical objects I am glad that you brought that up. So it's it's a little less so in services, I think. But services are almost ahead, <laughs> excuse me, ahead of the game because they're used to looking at these complex systems and trying to innovate a way to make them work together better. That's often what a service is, mm -hmm. right? So you have someone like, a delivery company and they're saying, hey, I can take this piece and this piece and connect them 
better than you could on your own. So that's a service they're providing. Um, that it's more of a more of a process improvement and less of a design improvement when we're talking about services. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think so. All right, uh, Kevin has a very interesting question. Um, he he asks, um, has there been an, an analysis to compare the additional cost of the circular supply chains versus the cost of savings from linear one? For example, how does the transportation and cleaning cost compare to the eliminated manufacturing cost in the Coca-Cola bottle case? So I think that's something that's always going to be in flux. Right. Um, if the system doesn't already exist and you have to build kind of the infrastructure for it, you have to invest in the machinery, you have to figure out a new way to do something that hasn't been done before, it's going to cost more upfront. Um, if you're switching to something that everyone is already doing, yeah, that's probably going to be cheaper. But over time, as more people and companies switch to circular methods, I think that cost point will level out. Um, there will be much more efficient ways to do it, uh, better partners to work with. Um, it it does normally look like, at this point in time, more cost up front, but the cost over time is uh, pretty significantly reduced. Looking at the the Coca Cola example, thinking about the amount of money it would have cost them to put that machinery in to wash and relabel the bottles versus the amount that it probably would have cost them to make those 1.8 billion plastic bottles in a single year. I would imagine after a couple of years that that pays for itself. I cannot yeah. confirm that specifically. That part wasn't listed in the case study, but I can speculate. So I would, just to, I would bet just, that. Go ahead, John. Sorry. I was just going to say, I bet that analysis was done to do that. Uh, you know, when when Walmart uh, changed the shape of the gallons of, uh, of their milk, the whole thing was based on transportation savings. savings. It did result in in, in uh, sustainability savings, but it was the whole business case was based on less transportation, more gallons of milk that could be carried. Mm. Yes. I, so so I, I just wanted to add um, that Dr. Ekmark and Dr. Kirsch are working on a case study um, which actually helps you calculate your costs related to carbon emissions and sustainability. So uh, as and when that case study comes out, um, I'm, I'm sure that would help you kind of calculate these costs for yourself and do your cost benefit analysis of different kinds of operations mm -hmm. and, and design a system which is sustainable as well as low cost. Um, there are a few more questions. So there is um, Ishwar. Ishwar is joining us from UAE. Um, he, he's in Dubai. Uh, wow. Yeah. So Ishwar oh, has this oh, question goodness. that it's what really are the cool. challenges um, uh, in, in implementing circularity in supply chains and specifically how is change management administered uh, to make it more efficient and effective? Change management uh, is always a challenge and will continue to be a challenge, um, especially in kind of circularity, sustainability, ESG generally. This is still a very new topic for a lot of people. So um, I would I would caution everyone to kind of pick your battles. Where is it most important? Where is it really worth, you know, standing up for this is something that that needs to be done? Um, I spoke with, <laughs> I spoke with another industry professional at one point in time that was debating, uh, asking the offices to reduce the toilet paper that they have. And I was like, oh. are you sure that's the best I want to pick? Are you sure this is going to be the best impact? Um, so things like that, you know, maybe, maybe we don't focus on, on those and we focus on things with a, a broader impact. <laughs> Employee satisfaction would come into that equation. It, it absolutely would. It absolutely would. <laughs> yes. Yeah. I, I like this idea very much of picking your battles. There's so many things to be done, and I'm sure there are some smaller things, but considering that this is a massive change initiative and we're trying to change how people think, focusing on the larger goals currently would probably get, give us better returns. Absolutely. Absolutely will. 
Uh, any? Do we have any? We are um, a little bit over time, but we can extend for a little bit more. Do we have any more questions? Anybody wants to ask or share some opinions, share some views about their experiences in sustainability and um, um, social governance also? All right, I think I think we are um, no more questions. Um, I I yeah, thank you everybody. I had a few announcements. So we um, are at the Center for Supply Chain um, are um, um, you know thankful to all of you. But um, um, interesting thing is we have more such um, very interesting sessions coming up on October twenty third. We have a special session next week by uh, Johnny Dixon. He's the president of the ILA, ILA, the labor union, which was at the center of the strike of the uh, Fort Lauderdale and the ports around that area. So he's going to present the longshoreman view of the strikes. And, and, and my pitch to him was that our newspapers have led us to believe that longshoremen are evil. Um, they are taking our country for a, holding our country to the ransom. Um, and um, I'm going to give you 30 minutes to talk to our people and convince us otherwise. Um, so that's the session on 13th November. We have um, a talk by a company in Germany called Vibe. They are going to talk to us about gamification in supply chain and logistics. Um, so gamification using psychology to get better engagement and better performance. And uh, on December 11th, we have Keith Moore speaking to us on um, um, using AI to schedule, uh, to create warehouse optimizations. I'm, I'm posting the links on the chat. All of them, hope you just don't want, just give me a minute. Um, I'm posting the links. Yes, hopefully this conveys all the links. Please con register, continue to support us. Um, and as I end, thank you, Dr. Ekmark, very much for your time and very engaging presentations. As you saw, our audience, as usual, is very curious. They have lots of questions. Thank you for being patient and answering all of them. Um, I um, hope we can continue this, uh, the case study that you're working with, Dr. Kirsch, and more such engagements to better drive awareness of sustainability and such initiatives in the industry. Um, and uh, if any of you have other suggestions, questions for what we could do to make these sessions better, please feel free to reach out to me uh, and let me know. Um, thank you again, everybody. Um, and uh, I hope to see you again next week itself um, for that session with the ILA union president. Um, and thank you again, Ekmar, Dr. Ekmark, and thank you, the audience. I will see you soon. Bye. Thank you, Dr. Thank Shaw. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Ekmar. Thanks. It was my pleasure. Bye now. Thank you so much.